All right. Poor Walter's always getting cut off. I will be back on tour with Walter in September in the Czech Republic. So if you are in the Czech Republic in September and also in Austria, I will be there. Uh, I'll post all those dates as they become as they come further up. Um, thanks for everybody for being here as always. Super appreciate it. And today is uh, brought to you by my good friends. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> at Watchtower Guitars over in Morristown, New Jersey. And if you use the code, yes, what's the code? What is it? Uh, JM Live, you get good for 10% off any new used PRS guitar amps, Music Man amps and basses, LSL guitars, Bad Cat amplifiers, Tuttle guitars that are in stock. So do that. So the first thing I want to say is obviously hello and thank you for being here. It's been an, uh, a Wednesday afternoon with me. I have some fun for you guys. I have a free ebook that you can use the link down below or BB's got it on the side there. It's um, Arpeggios Unlocked. Uh, un no, yeah, Arpeggios Unlocked Understanding or Working Through. I forget what my little subtitle is. <laughs> Seventh Arpeggios Across the Finger Words. So I give you the fingerings for major seven, minor seven, dominant seven, minor seven, flat five, and diminished seven and how you can work through this. And I have two uh, free videos that come with that. So it's kind of like a little mini course and how you can work through your seventh arpeggios. I have to say they are probably one of the most important things I ever worked on. I would say they're more important than scales. Ultimately, scales are important. Things are derived from scales. Yes, yes, yes. But if I'm soloing over chords, chord tones are the most important thing. So uh, scales become a little less important compared to chord tones. So if you know your arpeggios, you are doing really, really well. So that's that free ebook. Uh, you just go over and some people are like, oh, it says free. I have to enroll. Uh, yeah, it's free. You just enroll for free and you're not charged and you get it right away. Some people are, it doesn't say free. I have to enroll, but yes, you enroll for free. So it's just the way that site works. So thanks so much for being here, everyone. And today I want to talk about five uh, tone tips that, that you can use every day. And we're all kind of tone guys. And yes, I realize I have some Super nice high-end gear, but this doesn't really matter. This goes for everything. And I was talking with my friend Keith Williams, uh, our friend Keith Williams, a little earlier about this. And we went through some ideas. So Keith is always great to bounce everything off of that we do together. I do a lot of stuff with, we talk through everything ahead of time, which is super helpful. Okay. One of my favorite things to do on the fingerboard, that's right, on the guitar, just getting my, my, my notes up is to not play with the volume knob on 10. Let's see, hopefully we can hear some of this. Now, the small caveat here, I do not have treble bleeds in my guitars. So I don't necessarily like them or I find them to be kind of difficult, but this is all this kind of nerdy stuff that does make a difference, is I do have a buffer on the floor. My tuner always has a buffer. So that helps change the impedance or uh, so when you turn down your volume, it reacts the way I want it to. I got this trick this concept, I mean, I learned it from a bunch of stuff that uh, Nick and Dan talk about all the time in the pedal show. And I've heard Michael Landau, who is the, you know, the tone meister, talk about this stuff all the time. So he does not have a trouble bleeds, but he does have a buffer on the floor. Let's see what I'm talking about. So here's my guitar volume full up. Now, if I roll it back a little bit, What it does certainly rolls off your gain a little bit, but it takes off some of those spiky highs. Now, if we talk about Mike Landau, he almost is my understanding. I've heard him talk about this, and it's fairly well known for us guitar nerds that he never has his guitar volume on 10. He's always keeping it being like five and eight. Now, that all depends on all sorts of stuff, like what pickups you're using, what kind of tone pot or what kind of volume pot you've got on there, what the taper is. So. I don't go by numbers. I just go by my ear. And a lot of different pots have different tapers. So, you know, don't don't get too caught up in like, well, Jeff said I should have it on five, but it doesn't sound good. It doesn't matter. It could Your guitar could be five. That could be eight on my guitar, depending on the variances of the pots. And we've got Lyle here who can answer, explain all that stuff. I just kind of know that it's different. <laughs> so let's take a little listen. I'm going to try a Strat so we can hear the difference too. So I got a hum Nick Humbucker here. So I'm going to bring it down. All the way up. I'm gonna roll it back just a hair. Back up. 
back up to full. I'm just rolling this down, like literally down to nine, eight and a half. Keep on going down. So it got a little more muffly. Sometimes that's a bit more of the humbucker thing. Right? Back up here. Playing arpeggios. Get your free ebook. Now it's gonna, like I said, it's going to vary dramatically with the tone, with the volume pot, excuse me. Keep on saying tone pot, we'll get to that in a minute. So all the way up. Now I'm gonna clean up the guitar tone a bit and use a clean sound, a little overdrive. I'm using my uh, Bloomfield drive, but here's the clean. Roll that down. Right? So I'm sure you guys can hear that on online. Roll that back a hair. Roll that. So you hear there's a that high end is huge to me. And those are some of those things when I start playing, like I notice that stuff right away. Like I'm playing or somebody gives me the guitar, I'm like, oh, the volume's all the way up. First thing I end up doing is rolling back the volume just a little bit. So let me just switch guitars so we can hear how different uh, guitars react, different pickups, all sorts of stuff. So um, let's go over to my PRS. God, guys, I just love this guitar. <laughs> I never thought I'd be like totally sold on PRSs. If you told me this years ago that the guitar I'd be playing primarily right now would be a PRS, I would have not, not believed you. But here we are. Okay, so a little bit of grant gain on my neck pickup. So it's a brighter pickup. It's a little more single coily for a humbucker. These are Ron Ellis's signatures. Roll back. So I kind of live around there. Roll it back. Roll it up. So you're getting more gain, but you're also just getting a little less spiky. I know Joe Bonamas talks about this all the time. He never really has a guitar volume on 10. It's pretty common for guys, uh, who I assume a lot of you guys is kind of like this too, people who play in the same genre that I like to play in, uh, you know, jazzy, bluesy, rock, fusion-y stuff. If you're playing in a metal band and you want to be full volume all the time, it doesn't really work. You want to get more of that kind of harder sound or more quick attack or the transients. But for me, right? back a little bit. So it takes, it adds a little more low end, but you find that sweet spot. There it is. So I'm right there, I guess it's about eight. Um, so now let me just go to the bridge. Full up. Roll it back. Right? Turn my tone up. So you guys hear the difference? Let's just switch to a Strat. You can hear that. All right, let's do the 68. Okay. Now, especially on single coils, to me, it's really huge, right? So full up volume. Going back a hair. You guys hearing it? Look at that bridge. No tone knob on this bridge. Bring it down.
So I'm also bringing like to the volume of the guitar obviously comes down. But the first thing I hear besides like before a big volume drop is I hear some of the rounding of the top end. So to me, this is one of, those, one of my favorite things. Uh, you see when I play, if you see gigs, I, I'm messing with the volume knob all the time. Um, I find most guitar players, like I said, in the genre that we love, except for Robin. To quote Robin the other day, we were talking about this, about the tone knobs. He goes, yeah, I never touch that shit. So he doesn't ever touch them at all. It's always full up. And uh, he just rolls back his volume when he's done. So he never touches his volume knob or his tone knob, which is kind of crazy when you think about him, uh, how dynamic a player it is. So that's all coming from his hands. Okay, so, and I'll get to questions and everything in, in, a, in a couple. All right, so tone knob on the bridge. Uh, here's my next. Okay, so tone knob on the bridge and then dial in the amp. I've talked about this before. So now I haven't rewired. This is um, a 68. I, it, I didn't put the bridge tone knob on here. I normally do. I didn't do that yet on this. So I'm going to switch out of this guitar, which sounds great, into my 64. Into my 64 strap. Or any strat. Doesn't matter. So if we go to the neck pickup, I'm going to set my amplifier for the neck. And I've talked about this in a few of my videos. What a different stratty sound these two are. So sometimes when I go to the bridge, if I like that stratty sound, that might be a bit harsh for me. So what I've done, and this is something I stole from Eric Johnson many years ago, um, I've moved a traditional old style Strat will have the uh, the tone knob for the, this would be the tone knob for the neck, and this would be the tone knob for the, the middle, and there would be no tone knob on the bridge like my 68 has. Sounds great because when you have no tone knob, I'm going to probably put a no load pot on there. But sometimes when you go to that bridge pickup on a Strat, it can be pretty bitey, which maybe you don't always want that. So. I have the tone knob set on my bridge as well. So I can dial that back. So once again, it's all by ear. I don't know. It's the original, everything, the original wiring here. I just moved that wire except for the five way. So I don't know what the value of that cap is. It's the original. I just moved a wire because this was already some wires had been moved. And plus I'm playing the guitar. So here, so I've got this neck. Let's get kind of a little more. Might be a bill bright, so I roll that back. So I just go by ear, try to match them out a little bit. So I'm gonna write volume on full. Then. Where do I think they sound good together? As opposed to? So that can be really bright and bitey. So the first thing I do on any guitar, all my guitars have a, a tone knob for the bridge and I dial in the amplifier for the neck pickup. So sometimes that might be a bit bright, you know, maybe. Might be a bit bright, excuse me, for the bridge, and that's on purpose. So I dial in for the neck where I get that kind of, you know, fluty or whatever you want to call that hollow, great strat neck tone that I like. But when I go to the bridge, that can be a little bright. It's the same thing for a humbucker guitar. So let me just check that out on a Les Paul, and we'll hear that too. Same thing. This is what Bonamassa talks about. So I'm on my bridge. Everything's going to be up 10. So now, I want to clean that up a little bit. 
So now the neck pickup to me sounds a kind of a little more stratty, which I kind of like. It's not that sweet child of mine kind of fluty thing I don't really like about humbucker neck pickups. So now when I go to the bridge, might be a little brighter than I want. Let's roll back that tone knob a little bit. back my volume a little bit on both. So if you're at all adept at wiring, um, it's not that difficult at all to move. Uh, if you're using a strat to move that one, it's one, one wire, I believe, just from your middle pickup to the bridge pickup. So all my guitars are set up this way. I think it sounds so much better. I have so much more control over the tone. I've done a bunch of videos on this. This is 50s wiring. So that's a big part of the thing as well. Now you won't get some of these same sounds if you have a standard modern wiring with a treble bleed. So when you turn down the volume, it, it um, doesn't darken up a little bit like mine would. So there's two things going on. Once again, I'm using a buffer, which helps a lot. If I took the buffer out of line, it would get darker. And um, I just use buffers anyway, because you're running cables. And the treble bleed is, to, is there to make up for that. So when you roll back your volume, your guitar stays brighter. So if I were to maybe go on a gig with just guitar straight into an amp and I wanted to have everything, maybe I'd want a treble bleed, but I would always have to, I'd always want a buffer in the line because it helps the sound. For me, it keeps keep that high end a little brighter, even as I roll back the volume. So you might just ask, well, why don't you just use a treble bleed? Because I never, I don't like the way they sound. I know some people say that you could dial it and there's magic combinations of caps and resistors. I've not found any that I really like. Guitars feel most natural and organic to me with uh, no treble bleed. All right. Got a lot of, I have a lot of questions hopefully coming up. Please hit, hit questions first and I'll be happy to answer them. All right, next one. This is one that's really, really cool. Amp turned up, hands turned down. So very often when I'm practicing, let me go back to, uh, well, let's stand the last ball for a minute. Um, the amp might be much louder than I would. Um, I tend to have my amps a little loud. And not loud for the sense of like, I want to blow my ears out um, loud in the room. Like, oh my God, this guy's really loud. I, I can't get away from it. I don't mean that. I mean, um, it allows you to have some dynamics when you play. In guitar, um, unlike, let's say the trumpet. I played, I toured in a band with a trumpet player. And when he was warming up backstage, that is like the loudest freaking instrument in the world, uh, acoustically. So you can, they can go from whisper quiet to it sounds like a foghorn and it's really loud. So the guitar, we can't really do that unless we're playing through an amplifier. And if we're playing the kind of music we're talking about, a little more dynamic um, as opposed to hard rock, which doesn't stay quite as dynamic or metal or anything like that, um, that the volume of the amplifier, if it's up kind of louder than I would normally play if I'm strumming full volume, that allows me to play more dynamically. Now it's gonna be hard to do, you know, through the internet because you're not in the room with it, but if I have the amp a little low, a little louder, it allows me Now if you're here, at kind of at a gig volume or even like a halfway decent practicing at home volume, that's really dramatic. Here we've got compression and all that, and I'm playing through studio monitors, but when you're playing through your amp, and it's just a little louder than you would be going like this. So you see right now, that's like, wow, that's just ugly, but. So that's really important, and you learn to use your hands and the volume knob. So 
I didn't touch my volume knob there in the last part. It's all coming from my hands. And when you have that headroom on the amplifier, you can play softer and people can hear you. So that's the, to me, that's the magic stuff about playing guitar. That's what I look for in any guitar player. And you can work on it. You don't have to be super loud, just loud enough that it, you know, you feel like, oh, that, if I hit really hard, that's a bit, it's a bit much. Um, and it can be above TV volume, if you know what I'm getting at. Like, it doesn't have to be super loud. But when you start working this on a gig and then you get into a band that's really dynamic and you have enough volume and you're like, wow, this is really cool. Friends of mine talk about this. You know, Matt Schofield's on my show all the time. We talk about this. We've spoken about it on the air with David, that uh, how loud is too loud with David Grissom. And Robin is super loud. And all my favorite guitar players are kind of loud. And I don't mean loud for the sake of loud. I mean, because it allows you to be dynamic. And if somebody plugs into my rig and they're not used to it and they're sitting in, sometimes they're way louder than me simply because they're not used to maybe playing that way. So um, I also like to have a volume pedal on the floor. So it works like a master volume on my amplifier so I can really control everything. So that's the next one. All right. And I got one more. Um, this is a weird one. It's kind of funny. And some people may argue with me on this, but you always need less gain than you think. Um, a little bit of volume on a gig makes up for a lot of compression. So you're at home, you're trying to shred on something, you're trying to play a little faster. And the tendency for myself oftentimes is to have too much gain on because it, it emulates the compression that you get from an amplifier playing live. So if you're at home, and you're noodling and you're like, wow, it sounds great. And then you go to rehearsal, you're like, oh my God, like that's, there's the Fletcher Munson effect, right? We have much more low end going up, but there's also the, sometimes you just have way more gain. You turn on your, you know, your drive plan, like whoop, feeds back, or you sound a bit like a swarm of bees. So practicing with the least amount of gain you can is really great to do because one, it gets your chops together, right? That Then you know you're kind of doing it. Also, I've always found on gigs, I always dial back my gain. At home, I'm trying to emulate something being louder and that feel you get, which you just, it's very difficult to get a low volume. Lower gain on a gig also helps you cut through way better. Uh, that's a huge, huge thing that I learned years ago. Um, I started playing in metal bands when I was younger. You take a solo and you just kind of disappear because I was overly gained out. So the cleaner the guitar tone, as clean as you can get it, uh, that's definitely better. If you listen to old Van Halen, um, Eddie wasn't that distorted. You know, it wasn't like super shreddy distorted. Now, of course, if you're talking about someone like Steve Vio plays a lot of games, I'm not saying you don't have to. A lot of gain, you got a sound guy. If you have the mids right, you would just, all those things cool. But my favorite guitar tones are almost generally on the cleaner side, which is kind of really more fascinating to me when I started getting into it. And then when I started gigging more live, I realized that I would have way less gain than I would on the floor. You know, you, you do a sound check and you're like, whoa, that's where I kept my, your, uh, your pedal. So now this, that brings me to one final thing and I'll get to questions is, um, dialing in your rig at home is one thing, but the second you get to a rehearsal or a gig, it's completely different. You know, you're gonna probably turn down the bass in your amp. You're going to turn down the gain. Maybe there's certain frequencies that, you're only going to hear when you're loud. And when, you know, when, I, when I'm saying loud, I mean at a gig. And it's the only things that you're going to hear. If you're practicing at home at a lower volume, it's it's like a completely different thing. So that's, uh, those are five things that I think you can kind of start working on today. So just go through that real fast, that list. Um, volume knob, not all the way up, which I love. Once again, it's keeping the volume down a little bit on the guitar. Gives you a lot of sonic possibilities. Uh, warms up the, the high end or the front end of the guitar, the tops, dials it back. And then if I want to get more of that sound, I will use the volume all the way up. If I want to cut through a bit more, if I want to play a little more high gain, I think that sounds good because you get those that treble that really helps with the hot when, when you're playing higher gain. Um, tone knob on the bridge and then dial in the amp. So you're dialing in your amp for the neck pickup. You got the tone knob on the bridge. Pretty classic, pretty, pretty common thing to do. Um, Amp turned up, hands turned down. That's another big one. Um, keeping that headroom and practicing getting the dynamics from your hands 
and working with the amplifier as opposed to uh, like I can't use multi-channel amps. I mean, I have the, the T-Rex multi-channel, but I never use it as a multi-channel amp. I just use it as one channel because to me, the multi-channel amp is where my volume knob is in my guitar and maybe a, an overdrive pedal to push it over the top. To me, multi-channel amps are just weird. Like my, this is my clean tone. This is my dirty tone. Like this is my clean tone, you know, and this is my dirty tone. You know, so it's all coming from the guitar and that's, it's the way all the, yeah, it's the way Clapton did it. Good enough for me. Uh, and, oh yeah, one more. That was four. Less gain than you always think. So yeah, it was four. It's pretty funny because I did a little part there. Pick and finger. So you want to practice playing with your pick and or fingers every day. Uh, that goes along with the whole thing. So I'm going to the neck pickup. <laughs> Pick. Fingers. So I use my fingers more than I even actually think I do. And gigs, after being on the road for a few days, I'm like, oh gosh, my fingers are killing me because I end up, I use them more than I think I do. So in the heat of battle, you're playing a few sets. I start to get a little, they start to get a little raw there. So definitely rhythm guitar. Right, so they sound different to me, and I I can't imagine playing guitar without using my fingers. So when I I put my pick here between my first finger and middle finger, it's kind of thing like that. And I'm not talking about finger picking. You know, if I'm going to start playing some, you know, which I do all the time, I, I can't do that with a pick in my fingers. You know. My bad, Travis picking. So if I'm doing something intricate like that, I just have to put a pick down. But if I'm going to play, I'll hybrid pick sometimes, but I'll also just use fingers. And I'll just put the pick right there. All my favorite players do that. And to me, you start mixing that with turning the volume knob a little bit down. Uh, 50s wiring for playing a Les Paul. A little bit of volume on the amp, uh, playing with different some pick and fingers, then you're really starting to get into it. And for me, that's that's the the stuff. That's where the instrument becomes an emotional a conduit to what you want to say, as opposed to everything being one dynamic level. Okay. What do you guys think? Got some questions? Definitely fun. Uh, oh, I got to do my my Watchtower ad. All right, let me just do my Watchtower ad, and then we will get to questions. All right, so I'm really happy to have today's brought to you by my good friends over at Watchtower Guitars in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, one of my favorite stores, great guys, John, Wassel, and Steve. I think they're my favorite guitar store, just the coolest stuff, greatest guys. Um, the guitar, guitars like Gibson, Fender, PRS, Tuttle, Danacaster, Nacho, Novo, Music Man, and more, and most of it any budget. Carry a full line of PRS guitars from the SE models to private stocks, as well as some of the best amps available from Two Rock, PRS, Dramino, Rev, Amplified Nation, Tyler, Magnetone, Bad Cat, and Milkman. The store is run by a great bunch of guys, like I said. If you want to contact them directly, I would definitely recommend you do that. Sometimes their site doesn't always have the greatest stuff on it. They'll get back to you right away. And the number directly you can text or call is 973-900-4755. 
And anything you see that they have in stock, well, you can get 10% off by using JM Live for anything, I should say. Any newer used PRS guitars, amps, Music Man guitars and basses, LSL guitars, Bad Cat amps, and Total guitars that are in stock. Uh, two really cool things that are going on is, one, they are working with LSL Guitars with the former head of the Fender Custom Shop, Chris Fleming. Uh, he's doing an exclusive run of LSL Guitars for Watchtower, where he's going to hand do all of them with painting, relicking. They've got a bunch in order. You can also custom order one once again, 973-900-4755 for details. Um, also, we are doing a run of PRS Private Stocks. Uh, We'll do a video coming up in that. We went down to PRS a few months ago, chose out some really awesome wood and really cool stuff. And we have a, a custom inlays that we're going to show you guys. It's really kind of subtle on the inlays and beautiful tops, more subtle inlays. So for us a little more conservative guys, if some people don't like the birds, we don't have to have the birds with these line of guitars we're putting out. And they, we're going to do five of the single cuts and five of the semi-hollow double cuts. And the single cuts are all going to be like eight, eight and a half pounds tops. We really specified the weight because that's super important to me. And I'm looking forward to those getting done. And uh, it was a great experience going down there. So once again, watch Tower Guitars, 973-900-4755. Call or text. You guys should do like, I think like live commercials, something like the, being back in the, uh, like radio days, right? All right. So let me say hi to everyone. Thanks for everybody being here, of course. Um, Dave Keltner, Joe Burnett, uh, six <laughs> slick salmon. I love that. Uh, Randy Lert, what's going on? David Cromwell, Jason Carter. Hey, my brother Steve's here. What's up, Steve? Wayne Baser. Um, my knees hurt as always. Uh, Matt Gibson, what's up, Matt? Um, yes, yeah, Stephen, my brother has been to Watchtower. Uh, the entry. <laughs> Got me, Jeff got me to understand how dangerous it is to enter the doors of Watchtower Guitars. It it really is, uh, really is a, a, a bad thing to go in there. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, Timothy, uh, Timothy W. Cook. All of my humbuckers and P90s, all volumes are about, about five. I hate that spiky tone. Right. Yeah, it's pretty cool once you start getting into it. Um, Let's see, we got to just going through any questions. Uh, Lyle is saying treble bleeds, uh, good treble bleeds are so rare, in my opinion, too. In the 50s wiring, to me, it's just it's just the best. Um, BV, ACDC, prime example of not as much gain as people think. Absolutely. That was one of the bands that we talked about, too. Keith and I were talking about how, how different that is, you know, how, how little gain there are. Um, all right. How much does the cable of your guitar affect your tone? I've heard different options, opinions. Yeah, it can affect the guitar tone a lot, which is kind of crazy when you think, well, not really, but when I first discovered it, it was crazy. Now, sometimes um, you can try a really, really high-end cable, and I don't necessarily love those because sometimes they're a little too clean and, and sort of spanky. You know, they can be a little too bright. So I'm, I'm, I'm not always in love with the super high-end cables for that reason. But um, two different kinds I'm using. Well, I have a few high-end cables, yes. I have cables from Vemram, which are, they're expensive. I'm not suggesting that you definitely need those. That all comes down to kind of what amp you're playing in. Also, I find when I'm on a gig and someone starts banging on a cymbal and stuff, I don't hear quite those subtleties anymore. But I've been using it forever, the Diodario uh, American Stage which I think is a great cable, really affordable. Now, I do have an endorsement with the Adario. I love their strings and the cable's great. They last a really long time. Um, I don't worry about them. Uh, if you buy like a $100 cable or $150 super high-end cable, you know, you leave that in a gig, you're going to be kind of bummed. So I don't really hear the difference between the $40 cable and the $150 cable on a gig. So... Also, like I said, it depends on what kind of amps you're using. Honestly, if you have, you know, some nice high-end amps that really show things off or like a great super reverb, like really dialed in an old one, you're going to hear some of those differences, but I don't hear them quite uh, on stage. So, oh, like, oh, Lyle's in here. Low capacitance cables are usually microphonic. Good quality guitar cable is a good buffer. It takes the length of the cable out of the question. Exactly. So that's another reason why I use a good quality buffer is then I don't have to worry about 
if it's a decent cable like the Adiadaria one is, if I have a buffer, and the buffer I have on the floor right now, it's just the one that's in the Polytune. It's totally great. Uh, the Polytune 3, um, I have the buffer on there. It sounds awesome. Like, it's a great sound of buffer. I don't think you have to go a good quality buffer. That's a good one. JHS makes one. Every, a lot of places make really good quality buffers. I wouldn't necessarily say like a Boss pedal has a really great quality buffer, but... And my fancy pedal board that my friend Jimmy Archie is making, which should be done any day. I got to go there to my videos. I finally got my new iPhone to film better video. Um, I'm going to go over there and we'll pick that up. So um, there's a, a buffer in that that I have, like a buffer patch bay, which is really nice because I plug everything into that. I, I do like buffers in my guitars, in my guitar pedals or my pedal board. Without it, I find it's like, what's wrong? You're going to hear a lot of high-end loss. And it feels like a lot of the excitement is taken out. Um, okay, then there's like Matt Schofield, which who um, doesn't like buffers. Or he likes the sound of a 20-foot cable, a 40-feet of cable. And, but Matt leaves his overdrive pedal on pretty much all the time. So that's working as a buffer as well. If it's engaged, that is going to be somewhat of a buffer. But he doesn't really like buffers. I kind of do. We, we play differently. We play different kinds of music. I find I like a buffer and I'll just deal with the high end by setting my amp a certain way. So for him, he doesn't like, he doesn't like them as far as I know. Um, Michael Gibero, what buffer do you like? I, I do like the Polytune is fine, man. Which what I like about the Polytune um, three, I'm looking at the floor Polytune three, is that you can turn on and off the buffer. It's a great little tuner. It's, it's small. I would lift up my pedal board, but some, I've got some pedals in there that don't have any Velcro and everything's gonna fall off. Um, just, you know, a little small one like that. You can have the buffer on or off. And I think it's a good sounding buffer. It comes out at one meg. I, there's, I've done a lot of reading up on those things, but I really like that. So what does a buffer do? Well, um, it changes the capacitance and it, uh, from high or low, I don't, crap, I don't know this stuff. I always forget. I just know I like them. It changes. <laughs> low capacitance cables are usually microphonic. Okay, so then I'm looking over what Lyle said. So it changes the capacitance of the cable. I can't remember this is low or high, or, and I'm just, I should know this. But I forget, I'd second guess, and then you'll know. If you have a bunch of cable, and then you don't have a buffer, and you're like, why is everything? Okay, here's, here's, here it is. Take a short cable, you know, 10 foot, eight foot cable, plug right into your amp. Sounds great. Plug in a 20 foot cable, or plug in a bunch of cables and some pedals, and then sometimes you're like, what happened to my high end? You like, you feel like it's like a little blanket over the top of it. Um, so uh, that is where you would, where the buffer comes in. It just restores a lot of the high end and it changes the capacitance of the cable. So it doesn't, the long amount of cables isn't affected. Converts the high impedance pickups to low impedance that can travel further without losing signal and introducing noise. Thank you, Lyle. Yes. See, I always knew that. Change to low. Yes. And uh, and what's been cool about them was I didn't realize, and I think it was it was really actually Mick and Dan years ago who I always owe a ton of great. Um, I get a lot of great info from Mick and Dan, of course. Is they're like, oh yeah, like oh I don't like a, a buffer. I like a bu I don't like treble bleeds, but if I don't use a buffer, I, I can hear it. And I'm like, oh that's that's right. Oh I never thought about that. And then Mike Landar, I remember him saying the same thing when he was talking about. Uh, his guitars that he has out that he doesn't use treble bleeds and he always has to have a buffer in line for him for stuff to feel the way he wants it to feel. Okay. Uh, some more questions. Um, have you ever used a wireless system live? If so, what was the main tone difference from using guitar or cable? I've, I used them once many, many years ago when I was touring in a band, we had a big enough stage where I could use them. Um, I don't know, man. It, that was my sort of my hard rocky metal days. I don't, I can't say like I, I thought about tone then as much as I do now. I think I had a good guitar tone, but it was just like a hard rock medley tone. I was into it, but I, I you know, I don't play in a place big enough now with, with wireless. And I've just gotten what I like to do so cider dialed in that I, I personally would not go to a wireless if I didn't have to. Um, so how's that for an answer? Like, you know, my friend Angus, he's got 
he does wireless at the trans Siberian Orchestra because he has to. He's on on risers and flames and stuff behind him. So that's wireless, but it's it's a different kind of thing. For me, the music that I play primarily is an interactive live improvisational thing where the tone and the interaction with the band is a big, huge part of it. Um, and there's never a room big enough that I need a wireless system. So if I were playing in the garden, yeah, I'd go wireless. I'd supposed to run around with a big cable. I could, depending. I don't know. I'll let you know when I play the garden. Uh, I don't... The main difference I know is that you can run around. But I would... It's got to have a... That, that buffers it. I know... Like, there's that really cool thing, uh, Solo Dallas, it's a Dallas, uh, that the preamp section of the wireless that Angus Young uses as part of his tone, he puts that out, so it's pretty cool. Um, how loud can you push the home DB-wise? I don't really play loud uh, because, um, you know, I live in New York City or in Brooklyn and my neighbors are here and I just don't want to be a dick. Um, I probably am to them anyway, but I'm, I'm very, I'm pretty cool about how loud I play. But I, what I'm saying about playing loud, it's just loud enough that you can experiment with being dynamic. If you're always playing at a whisper volume, like I'm watching, you know, my wife's watching TV and I'm trying to play it, like that's not going to be what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just loud enough that if you play really hard, it's it punches, and if you kind of roll back the volume or play softer, you can feel the dynamics in the guitar. It's as close, you can, you, it's not going to be the same as doing that on a gig where you actually have some real volume. And then that's a real thing you have to learn too. Learning how to handle volume on stage is really, really, really big. That's why a lot of bands are too loud. They just start playing and they don't have a handle on, on volume, which is really based upon experience, I have to say, you know, because it's a whole, it's a different thing. So rehearsal is good, but if I live in New York, nobody rehearses. I mean, I, I don't have any rehearsals for my gigs. We just run through something at a sound check. I trust that I have charts and I trust that they learn the material. So when I go to the Czech Republic, we rehearse one the day before and then we just start the tour. And we usually just end up, depending on how much time we have to rehearse, if the club gives us the, you know some time, just trust that everybody does it and uh, learns the material. And yeah. Rehearsals are good, but the answer to that is having really, really good charts and hiring conscientious people. So all my charts are real. I hired a friend of mine to write my charts because he writes much better charts than I did. He wrote out the bass line, he wrote out drum kicks. Like he wrote out all the things everybody needs to have. So for me, um, that's that's uh, the answer to not having rehearsals. Hiring the right people who take who care about your music and then also good charts really help. So Eric Clapton at Massacre Garden several times. He does not use a wireless. Yeah, um, nobody I know of of my favorite guitar players uses wirelesses. It's just, you know, you just get used to it. It feels different. The wireless stuff, like if you're Angus Young, who sounds amazing, but he's, you know, running around a stage doing the whole thing. That's a rock show. So to me, that's a different thing um, as opposed to, you know, Clapton's just kind of... Clapton's performance would be the same as if you were playing a, a small bar as opposed to a big thing. It's not a... It's not you know, duck walking across the stage, you know, like uh, Angus does. Um, uh, my experience with my ancient Nady 49R was that there was a slight change in tone, but the small uh, through the years has been okay. It's about 40. Yeah, you know, you get used to it too. You just start to dial it in, you know. Um, I live in a flat, as opposed, uh, so I suppose Jeff does. I just want to understand... Uh, some uh, some meter to both. I don't ever put a meter on, it, but you know it's it's just a little bit a little bit louder, you know. Um, also, I spend a lot of time. Getting more notes. You know, really working on trying to play something dynamic like that. So if I turn up my gain, 
So that's as much we got on there. So if I had the full gain, So that's just from my hands. It would be cooler in my mind if I were at somewhat of a volume, you could get more dynamic and the amp starts to give you that harmonic feedback and you can really play across, like really play against that. And that's something that only volume can do. And I keep on talking about volume, but I don't mean crazy loud. I mean, where you kind of create a little bit of a circuit between you and the amplifier. So uh, Lyle just posted, a 15 watt amp can get you evicted. Yeah, five watt amp. I mean, people are like, oh, I got a champ because I get to practice at home. I'm like five watts is freaking loud. So uh, it's really, um, pedals are cool. I've just had a few thoughts. Like, you know, using a pedal, like, you know, I get a pedal I like. Um, when that cleans up. Right? Yeah. Now I find this is where that fifties wiring really, really is a great thing because it's a weird, it's a weird beast. How like if I turn down the tone. It, it interacts so very strangely, and I did a whole video, excuse me, on this. So all my two humbucker guitars are set up like this. If the volume's on 10, and I roll back to tone, I get that cool, you know? You know? Right, I get that, the, the woman tone. But, if, so check this out, I go to the bridge. If I roll back the volume, Roll that tone up a little bit. The tone is on two, but when you roll the volume back, the whole guitar cleans up. So it doesn't necessarily get dark, it almost gets a little brighter. I don't know exactly why. What the, the you know, the physics of this are. But I know it is something that's really important to my guitar playing at this point for me to get the most out of a guitar. So that's the 50s wiring thing. Um, people ask me about how to, to re do that. It's not a it's not a big mod to do it. I think it's simply like moving one or two. I've done it on my own. You just get it go online. Let's bring it to your tech. It's really easy to do. And it changed, changed everything uh, for me or made a lot of other things make a lot more sense. Like how's how does he get that great clean tone when he plays and he just turned down his volume? Why does it change that? The 50s wiring is really big. Lyle well, said I should do, do I need to do a video on 50s wiring. Yeah, man, that would be awesome. Maybe we should uh, you know, we should we should do a live together. That would be cool. I'd love to have we should talk about that. That would that'd be awesome just to kind of answer you could answer dumb guitar player questions like mine. Yeah, I'm a professional. What does the buffer exactly do? Is it high capacitance or low? <laughs> Let's forget this stuff. Um Jason Carter, what studio monitors do you use? Um, is there much difference between monitors and playing through an amp live? Yeah, okay. I'm using just cheapo old M Audio BX5s. They're just they're ancient. But I, everything's kind of dialed in. It sounds good. Um, if it ain't broke, kind of, uh, you know. A um, few things. Uh, uh, playing through studio monitors is very different than playing through a live amplifier, for sure. Uh, you guys know much I love my fractal stuff. It's awesome. Um, but it emulates the sound of a mic'd amplifier. There's totally different than playing in a room with a real amplifier. Experientially, it's completely different. And uh, me and my friend Mike Cope is here. We uh, we did some recording helping with his record. 
And it was the first time he's really played through an amp and volume. And he was like, oh my God, like it, it all makes sense now. And I'm like, yeah. It's the first time I played through like a JTM 45 100 with a Strat and a fuzz face. Um, Hendrix made much more sense to me. Uh, not his brilliance, but his, how he was doing some of the things that he did. Because it's this connection between you and an amp. And you just can't get that through a studio monitor. It's just different. But, you know, the world is what it is. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, there's a price to pay for everything, as my tinnitus will tell you. So it's important that you, you think about that too. But just loud enough. So the studio monitors do sound different. There are some really great ones out there. I haven't gone too deep down that road because it, these things just start to get very expensive. Everything sounds kind of good right now. And... You know, I just get, just get that. Uh, people say like, oh, what kind of home recording gear do you have? Very little because I'm a bit of a completist. You know, it's like, it's like me. I think we've talked about it. I'm an espresso nut. I'm a coffee guy. I love coffee. And I've purposely not gone for a really high-end espresso maker. I just use my Nespresso maker or I'd use like a AeroPress or a pour over because I know I'm going to go nuts and I'm going to want the crazy expensive machine. I already weigh the beans and grind them. My wife thinks I'm insane. I tie it and all that kind of stuff. So I know who I can be. So if I want to get my guitar recording, I just don't have the facility to do it here. I don't have the facilities. Like I can't turn up a guitar amp here really loudly. So just using this stuff, it sounds great. If I have to really important stuff like my record to do, I think a mixture of some things recorded at home in the box, as they call it, and live can sound really good. Given my druthers, it'll always be a live amplifier, but I can't always do that. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, well, Lyle, great, man. Let's do it. Um, yeah, we should get in touch. Can you, I can reach you through your website. I'll reach you through your website. We'll do it. That'd be fun. Um, playing, this is from Otto von Fledermaus. Playing dynamically is one of the things I'm trying to do. I very much like using knobs in the guitar. I also 50s wiring on my telly and I love it. Yeah, it's it's huge and it's, um, let's try something else. Uh, now it's just a flex, now I'm just flexing. All right, so. So we got the 50s. 50s wiring on the 50s guitar. bit bitey. So I just roll back that tone knob because this neck P90 can be, it's really high output P90 for this neck. I feel it gets a bit woolly. I can't really lower it. It's, you know, it's an old guitar. I'm not going to mess with it. So I really have to dial back the tone knob on this bridge. Hey, um, okay. Let me look at, uh, I missed a question. Let me go back. Um, who asked me if I didn't see the question? Okay, Jeff Ramsdale. Let me, let me, did I miss your question? Sometimes it's hard uh, to make sure I get these questions. Let me see what you got here. Looking back. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I don't have Ron Hellis money. <laughs> what pickups would you recommend for an HH Strat to get in the vicinity of your sound? Um, Duncan makes great pickups, man. They really do. Um, I'm not sure um, what particular model. Uh, people really like the antiquities. Um, I think Seymour Duncan makes great stuff. They do. You know, I mean, uh, Lawler, a little more expensive, but not crazy. You know what makes really good stuff that are, I think are pretty affordable is Bare Knuckle. They're a little more pricey, I think, than the Duncans, but they're not... They're not as expensive as Ron's pickups for sure, or throwbacks, which is the other pickups I like. Yeah, those are pretty pricey. 
Um, I do. I think they're worth it. Yeah, I do. Um, but I, you know, I think sometimes if you're playing, I, if I play, I have a nice sounding amp that really picks up those things really nicely. If you're playing through like a lot of other things, like, you know, not a two rock or an old Marshall or something, you're playing through like a regular, it, those subtleties are maybe not 100% there. You know what I mean? Um, so I replaced the land. The, the my Lando did come with Lollers. Yeah, they came with the Loller Imperials. I just uh, I like the bridge. I didn't love the neck pickup on that. Uh, I found Ron's pickups to be a little more um, have a little more high end uh, attack, which I really really like. Um, I might change the neck pickup in that one to um, his a what is it? I might put those are LRPs. I might put a signature in the neck or. Um, something else. He's got a few other ideas. Um, so I hope that answers your question. There's so many great pickups out there, but uh, bare knuckles are really great, and I don't think they're that crazy expensive. And I see some of you pick up, people have uh, picked up the Arpeggio free ebook, uh, Arpeggio's Unlocked. Go on over and check it out, guys. It's for free. You just have to enroll for free. People say it's free. It's free. Just enroll. It's yours. And there's a bunch of, there's two videos, well, three videos with it explaining on how to use this. Just letting you know, it is, uh, it's showing you how to do it. Learning your arpeggios are, is probably the single most important thing I really worked on as a performer, as a player, as a musician. Also one of the most time consuming things. So me giving you this is like, here, this is how you do it. See you later. You know, but you just do one arpeggio at once, work on a major seventh or use one that you're going to use a lot. A minor seventh arpeggio, just work on your minor seventh arpeggios. Just... It's a great way, and you start to see these how the chords work. Also, um, for you guys have my courses and over at Jam Guitar Lessons, um, you know that's on there. I put it also up there. I wanted to give you guys some a thank you and a free course and all that. But also, it's it's a nice reference guide for any of you guys have my courses. If I start referring to an arpeggio, they can go there and they're right there. So those are really cool too. Devin, what's going on, man? My friend Devin from Darwin, Australia. Uh, got Barry Knuckle, Rory Gallagher pickups and two of my strats and love them. Yeah. Um, I hear a lot of great stuff about them. I don't have many guitars. A bunch of my friends use them. They love them. So, good stuff. Um, Jared Hicks, would you say learning arpeggios helped you with playing over changes in the Robin style? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, look, if we're talking about, um, you know, an A7 chord. Right? There's my arpeggio. So I'm playing over that chord. I just know what are the right notes to play over that chord because the arpeggio is showing me what the notes are. So as I'm playing A7, I'm always thinking about, you know. Now, as I say in the little videos with this, now going. That's cool. You want to work in that, it's great. But that just helps you going blah, 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 blah. like that's great exercise. You should do it, but that doesn't necessarily make you create music. So you can take little ideas. I'm thinking A7, my fingering right here. So if I have this kind of, right? Of course, you're not going to sit there and just do up and down. So I got my four chord, which would be D7. E7. So what I'm always thinking as I'm going through that, A7, A, C, sharp, E, G, C. D7, D, F sharp, A, C. E7, E, G, sharp, E, D. Now, I'm not thinking those notes I'm playing. I just know the arpeggios. I know the sounds. And through practicing, here's my E7 arpeggio. When I have an E7 chord, to D7, to A7. So yeah. Um, for example, a perfect question. There was a solo. I remember the first night I did a gig with Rob in someplace in California on a tour. And we did this tune, had a few changes in the middle, in the beginning, I forget, one of my tune I really liked by him. 
um, oh man, from Renegade Creation, cool tune. And he had we had done a rehearsal and he had taken a solo or we did two rehearsals real fast. And then it's like the first song of the set, he just points at me for the solo. I'm like, hey! Like I didn't think I had a solo in that song and had a bunch of changes. So I fortunately practiced what I preached and um, I had the presence of mind to be a little relaxed. And I said, you know what you're doing, you know what you're doing. Um, and I just outlined the chords really simply. And I got the, the face, yeah. You know, because all I did was I didn't panic. I knew the chords of the tune because I was used to playing the tune and I just fortunately kept the presence of mind and just outlined the chord changes very, very simply. So the cool thing about learning your arpeggios besides they're essential is you're always going to sound good. So uh, I studied jazz in college, jazz major. Uh, in my mind, compared to my friends who are jazz guitar players, I'm a terrible jazz guitar player. But I can make, I can play over changes because I understand how this all works. Uh, am I going to be, you know, Wes Montgomery or George Benson? No, I don't have that vocabulary. It's not where my strengths lay. But you give me a bunch of difficult chord changes, I can make it through it. I might not sound as cool as a guy who's that's their, their thing. But by knowing my arpeggios, I'm not afraid of chord changes anymore. I could be afraid of the tempo of chord changes. Like every time people talk about Giant Steps, that great that Coltrane tune, which is really difficult to play over. What makes it really difficult to play over, if you know your arpeggios and such, is the tempo, right? So if you're playing over, little slow, I can play over, but if it's one, two, one, two, then you're trying to play through all those changes of the tempo. That's really hard. So when something like that comes my way, I, I just bow out. I think I did... It was a gig that we did at Sweetwater. It was me and Robin and, and um, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot his name. I'm getting old. <laughs> plays Elton John. Yeah, just you know the guy who plays Elton John. He was in the Helicasters. Oh my gosh, sorry, being totally. I do this all the time. And those guys decided to call Masquerade. You know the the George Benson tune. And I was like, um. No, I don't know it. They just said, let's call that. You know that tune. I'm like, no, I don't know. I'm not going to sit there and like, I don't know the changes. I don't know the tune. So I just walked off stage. I said, oh, I'll be right back. So, you know, it's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Those guys did a great job. And I decided to uh, not look stupid on stage. Um, okay. Any more questions? We got a bunch of people here. Okay. Um, Oh, I picked up the arpeggio course. Thanks, man. I think you guys will dig it. Uh, it's a bit more like a reference thing. Which, uh, John Jorgensen, thank you so much. Oh, my God. Nice guy. It's being an idiot. Can't believe I forgot his name. Thanks. Everybody's typing in John Jorgensen. You like, you know, you, I had his name in my head, and then you know, you're live, and suddenly like, oh, boop, just popped out. John Jorgensen, yes. So we did that. Uh, we taught together at Sweetwater. Robin, John, and I, and that was fun. And like I said, yeah, he called Masquerade, and I'm like, I'm out. Because, uh, yeah, why do that to myself? Um, well, okay, with, with this stuff, too, um, some of these tone ideas are the main thing. If you look at, if we go through the, the ideas, I'm sure it's not Al Jorgensen, yes, from, from Ministry, right? Um that's funny. <laughs> if we go through, once again, my list. Where is my thing here? Okay. Find tone tips. Okay, so the volume knob, not up all the way. Tone knob on the bridge, dial in the amp. Okay, amp turned up, tones down. Pick and fingers. And uh, always need less than you think. These are all really part of the same big picture of playing dynamically, right? These are all those things that are going to interact with your playing and hopefully with other people when you're playing music. If you're not playing music that allows you to do this, it's going to be hard to do. So if you're talking about, say, if you're in a, uh, you know, a Slayer cover band or if you're in Slayer, um, who I actually do like a lot of Slayer tunes, it's, it's when, they, when the band brings it down, every, the whole thing comes down as a unit. Whereas if you're playing 
the kind of music that we're all kind of love, I think. There's a lot of interaction as individuals, and there's playing off of each other. So these dynamic things can come into real play for you because you're not locked into an overall volume of everything. So if you're jamming on a fusion thing or a jazz thing or a blues thing, or even super simple blues, it's still, still really, you know, you can get away with doing this stuff. That's all from the hands and the thumb, and it's basing upon how loud I have the guitar amp, and those are the things that are important. So it's all connected. It's all about playing dynamically, which is, to me, the most most important thing. Okay. Um, anybody know for sure what's the Marshall behind Jeff? I recall it in two and Donald Jumpered Master Volume added, but don't recall them all. It is a it's a super lead, hundred watt, and it's from nineteen seventy two. So it's a hand wired super lead. Um, they were eternally jumpered. My my tech, he was great. He's like, you know, if you're on the road, why don't you just jump them internally? You're doing it anyway. You have to worry about the cable. And he he's a pretty well-known guy. So I'm like, all right, sure, let's do it. So he did it. Um, it doesn't look as cool as having the two things, but it's been great. Never have to worry about it. Um, and uh, it has a master volume on it. Yeah. Um, the My favorite thing actually has been the, the power station, because then I can actually crank the amp and then ride the volume with the power station, which is great. But yeah, I put a master volume in it just because on gigs, you know, it's just too freaking loud. I don't really gig with that thing anymore. It, um, it's just too big, too heavy, lazy. It's heavy. It's big. Like, you know what I mean? You're walking in with this big amp and super leads are, you know, they tilt to one side because they've got the big transformer and all that. I love them. They sound great, and they got a great clean tone. One of my favorite clean tones is a Marshall. We talked about that many times. But, you know, uh, the two rocks are greater. They're divided by, like, they're smaller. Uh, not necessarily that, that they're necessarily lighter, depending, but they are smaller and easier to deal with. And the master volumes, I think, on those are, on the two rocks, a little more integrated than you've just the nice master volume you put in here, but this doesn't feel quite the same. Um, what about hybrid picking? Um, what about it, Wayne? What do you, what do you, what do you mean? Like, I, I mean, I, yeah, I work on hybrid picking all the time. I do that as well. Um, so yeah. I don't, um, I don't consider myself a chicken picker at all. I mean, I can fake some stuff, you know, a handful of country licks that I've learned, but I, I use hybrid picking all the time, all the time. Um, you like the attenu attenuation of the power station more than the ox. All right. Hey, Matt, what's going on? Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I talked about this, uh, last week. I don't mean that I'm happy to talk about it again. To me, there are two different products. The, as an attenuator, I'm going through the aux right now. I don't like the attenuation on the aux because it's just like a step attenuator. Everything just sounds kind of fizzy and, and, and crappy. It's a different concept. It's great because I have it all the way attenuated and then it has the artificial amp cabinets in it and reverb and all that. And so it's really useful for home recording. And that's what I'm using it for. So it's a, I use it as a load box with their, um, with their software. And I really like that a lot. The power station can work as a load box. It does not have any IRs or anything like that in it or any any sort of um, uh, digital stuff at all. So it works as a load box. If you want to use it for IRs, you would have to do it with the third party thing like a plug-in. But what it does is it reamps everything. So it could be a load box and it's a hundred, this one's a 50 watt power amp. So you can crank up your super lead. It takes all the power and then you drop it down anywhere you want. 
you need to turn up the volume. So it's like a huge master volume for your loud amp. I think it's um, it's a great it's a great invention. I think it's a ton of fun. So guys were doing in the in the eighties and nineties for years. Like they were slaving their Marshalls into a load box into a big power amp. So Eddie was doing all these guys. They'd reamp everything. Uh, Landau, all the LA guys who had other people moving their their gear for them. <laughs> so uh, will I use it on a gig? Uh, maybe if I have decided to use a super lead on the gig, maybe I don't know. But I, I kind of like using the pedals. I just feel really confident now playing through my two rock pretty clean and using overdrive pedals. I think I can get pretty close to the sound I like, and then I have control over everything volume wise. Um, yeah, as, as PB said, the ox is great, but not a, as an out and out attenuator. Ox is more useful for, for other things. Yeah, they're two different products in my mind. The attenuator on the on the ox, the the, temp, the, the tiered one, is more like a, just an add-on in my mind. Um, Wayne Baser, another technique to put in your bag. Yeah, hybrid picking. Have you tried the Tone King Royalist Mark III? I have not, but I know Tone King stuff is really good. I haven't tried that. Um, yeah, I'm pretty pretty psyched on the amps I have. I mean, there's always more stuff, but, you know, I think I'm kind of good. And you got to learn to live with a certain amp that you like. You know, you start to dial in something that you really dig. Um, yeah, the PS100 is probably the most transparent attenuator sound. You can also pump up a smaller watt amp into a 412. Right, so um, you could plug in like a 5 watt amp into a power station and crank that up. Uh, Matt, I have the aux, but the step down attenuation is not great at home. Exactly. Was seriously interested in swapping for the power station, plus the new aux stomp offers the IRS. So you, yeah, best of both worlds. You could probably run your line out of yeah you could run the line out of the power station or the attenuated thing um into the the ox stomp yeah I'm sure you could probably do that for sure how about the rare rock crusher no nope. i mean i don't have a lot of I, what amps okay let me just go through the amps that i have experience with i used to play bogner's for a long time reinhold and york great guys um great amps just not my taste anymore um but he makes great stuff. I mean, he makes those newer. I like the, you know, the, his more vintage style amps. So, but I'm not using those anymore. Um, I have a lot of experience with Marshalls, uh, 800s and, um, yeah, Lyle's got a point with there. So Marshalls like 800s, um, sadly, uh, 900s. I've had to use those on the road, which are just an abomination to all things Marshall. Um, sorry for anybody who's got one and uh, some Fender amps and then the, the two rocks those are the stuff uh, I love boxes on gigs I don't love boxes at home because they don't have a lot of low end I think they sound a little louder you know sound good louder um, also uh, yeah I don't know so me like the two rock is you know it's a lot like I want to say like a Fender but it's kind of Fendery you know or Boogie or Marshall, I'm sorry, or Dumblish, which is kind of fendery. They make sense to me. Uh, the amps that I can't really get with are the multi-channel things. Um, I just like a good sounding clean platform. And you, there's so many great pedals out these days that I think that that's a great way to go. So I don't have, I don't have a lot of experience with like uh, the Rivera's or um, some other stuff. I had a Friedman Dirty Shirley, which I thought was a really nice sounding amp at home. I think Dave makes great stuff. I tried that vintage Plexi he just put out or is putting out, and that sounded awesome at NAMM. That might be on the wish list. Uh, I had a Dramino, which I thought was awesome. Um, I don't know why I sold that. I know Greg, I'm probably going to get one of his eventually again because he just makes a great old Marshall, 50 watt. So, um, but I mean, do I, I've got two rocks and I love two rocks and those guys are my friends. So I'm quite happy and uh, ridiculously so. Um, attenuators, this is from Lyle, who knows the, uh, attenuators can go into speakers, have attenuators going into a speaker of limited usefulness. After so many dB down, the speaker just doesn't react and pick up, right, and the pickup speaker interaction falls apart. Yes, okay, so just for that, a lot of people say, hey, do you run your Marshall through the power station at like super low volume? I, I can, but... First of all, why torture my Marshall at a, you know, crank in a hundred watt super lead to do its thing, to turn it down to zero, you know, and then run it through 
uh, a power station. It sounds cool, but I can, if we're starting to do that, um, I can kind of get a, something similar with pedals or close enough. Or at that point, I just pra- plug into my fractal and I get the same kind of thing. Where it starts, to, if I start turning up the volume a little bit, where Lyle is talking about the interaction between you and the guitar and the pickups and the speakers are doing what they want to, then it's great. But that's not TV volume, you know? So I usually don't torture my 72 Marshall at 10 to run into a power station to turn it down to, you know, 8 dB or whatever. That's super low, but you know what I'm saying? Super low. I don't usually do that. Um, Germino makes better Marshall than Marshall ever did. Yeah, Greg does, man. He makes great stuff. So I'm going to get a, a, a lead 55 from him. He was going to make me one, but um, recently, but uh, some some un, unplanned home repairs kind of scuttled me buying anything <laughs> for a little bit. But it's better than that than having a, a septic line break in your basement, right? So. Um, Jeff, does that gold, that beautiful gold top have jumbo frets on it? Yeah, it's got 6105s on it. Uh, all my guitars do 6105s. I've got 6100s on a Jumino, uh, no, on a Tuttle over there. And the, um, the PRS has got, six, the, the Grissom's got 6100s. I like bigger frets. The smaller ones I, I just can't get into. So I can play 6105s I like a lot, and I like 6100s. Yeah. Uh, I've been on a waiting list for Kingsley Juggler for a year, and I think my name's about to come up. Any suggestions for use, favorite settings? You know, watch the video from that pedal show with um, Simon, the most recent one where he takes you through there, right? Takes you through his setup on that pedal. Watch that because I have the pedal, and after watching that, that actually helped me dial in the pedal better. It's... um, they're a bit tweaky. It's like a dumbbell. Like you, they cascade the volumes and you got all the switches. So better than me trying to guide you in any way, watch the video from that pedal show with Simon. It's the last one they did. I don't remember the name of it, but just that pedal show, Simon Jarrett, and it'll come up. I think it's it's like a year or two old. That was the one that really helped me dial that in. Bebe would know. He was, I'm sure. He knows everything. Um... Kevin, is the approach to learning arpeggio similar to learning the shapes of the pentatonic scale and modes? Yes, 100%. Absolutely the same thing. It's just memorization. Guys, it's always my pet peeve. Um, when people say like, oh, that's a jazz chord or like that's an E-flat demented, you know, some sort of thing. And I'm like, it's understanding this stuff is not that difficult. Using it is difficult. Getting it together on the guitar is difficult. The first thing of understanding what notes are in a C major seventh arpeggio, C E G B. Just write it, memorize it. C E G B. That's it. And so you, to make that a dominant seventh chord, you flat that seventh. So it's C E G B flat. If you want to make it a C minor seven, it's root flat three, flat five, flat seven, C E flat G B flat. Like so. These things are not that difficult. I know people start to glaze over, but if you kind of put it aside, like I've learned how to do some other simple things, learn how to use a computer or learn how to do this or that. It's not that hard. Trust me. Playing it on the guitar, I'm not saying that's easy. That's freaking hard. And applying it is is difficult. But if you just memorize, as I say in the video that comes along with the, uh, the, 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 the ebook, just take your time. C major seven, work on one finger. Right? Okay, I feel pretty good. That's root three, five, seven, root three, five, seven, root. C major, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, root. One, three, five, seven, root, three, five, seven, root. So if I want to make that C dominant seven, it's root three, five, flat seven. Well, one, three, five, seven. Well, I flat that seven. And you know, if that's all you do in one day or a few days, great. What happens with this, which is really nice, is it starts to snowball. Like your pentatonic scales or any scale you learn, you just do it long enough for a few days, you're like, oh, so me moving that over to G isn't really that hard. It's just the same thing, you know? So um, really 
Yeah, it's the same thing as learning your pentatonic scales, same thing as learning your major scales. I just think people get kind of flipped out about it because of Peugeot's and sometimes the names can be kind of nutty. Like, you know, if somebody says to you, okay, let's play A7 flat, 9 flat, 13. Sometimes people are like, what? You know, and if you just know where your flat 9 and your flat 13 are, it's easy. Um, man, it can, the great thing about guitar is it can be very picture oriented. So I'm not saying you know, this is something you get together in a day. Learning your arpeggio is definitely not getting together in a day. But if you kind of put aside that like, oh, this is just very simple memorization at first. You're talking about the names of the notes in the chord or the chord spelling. Just simple memorization. That's it. Even if you don't know it on the guitar, that's the hard part. But if you could sit down and go, okay, Jeff's, Jeff's handout says that C major 7 is C, E, G, B. Well, that's root three, five, seven. So if I want to make it C7, oh, I just flat my seven. So what's my seventh? Oh, that's B. So C, E, G, okay, that C, E, G, B is C major, seven. And so C dominant seven, C, E, G, B flat. Like that's, that's what I did at college. Just wrote some of them out. Just memorize that. So if you know it in your head and then you start working on guitar, it all starts to kind of come together. It's a tall order. It's, you know, look, anything freaking worthwhile is... You got to work on it, right? I mean, I'm trying to learn Italian. <sighs> I feel like an idiot, you know, like I don't remember the stuff. Um, you know, I'm trying to get my my, my dual citizenship there. Um, so I, I have a great in because my wife and son right now have their dual citizenship. And so uh, for me to, to get mine, I have to learn how to speak Italian at a B level. It's a lot of work if you're not in it every day. So I understand, but I think your arpeggios are easier to learn than Italian. <laughs> For sure. Because <laughs> one's is memorization. I just play this, you know. All right. Um, yep. Knowing your triads, knowing your triads, your intervals in your halfway there. Absolutely. So there's a whole bunch of ways to do it. You want to memorize the names of the notes, C, E, G, B, root three, five, seven. You want to know the intervals. And the cool thing is, is you just write it out on a piece of paper and just start to write them out. That's what I did in college. It's really great. Otto von Fledermeister, you can teach me Italian. My friend Ermano Bonifazi, who lives in Italy, Italy you know, we're gonna, he's, he's starting, he's going to help out. I might actually, he's like, yeah, come stay with me for like a month. And then you know, come stay with me for like a month and, and, and get enrolled in a... Immersion, immersion thing, which I might do. Steve Moore, oh, you think arpeggios are easier than Italian? Yeah, for me they are. <laughs> um, oh yeah, man, uh, Jason Carter, I'll become a master guitar player before I get fluent in German. German. That's a that's a tough language. So I mean, it's Italian. I, I living in America, I, I took some Spanish in high school and in New York. There's a lot of Spanish speaking people and. So you just pick up on a lot of these things right now. So the Spanish and I've been to Latin American countries and a lot. Um, so Italian, there's at least the Romance language. There's there's things that make sense and connections for me. When I was in the Czech Republic, it's just like I it's just completely they have a different word for everything. He's an old stupid Joe. Um, German too, just wow, that's a completely different. Completely different language. <laughs> of course it is, but you don't understand what I'm saying. If you speak English and you live in the United States and you're often familiar with Spanish, a lot of things make a lot more sense to me. It's like, you know, I said, you know, learning Japanese. My, my son is learning Chinese. It's amazing. Um, now, I understand your coffee thing, Jeff, right? Uh, the modes are easier. Th the, the modes are easier than Greek. That's pretty funny. Yeah, I've lived in Germany for four and a half years and I still sound like a novice. Yeah, that's a tough language uh, from my friends who've learned that. Um, yep, I speak German, Italian, English, and a bit of Spanish. I got you covered, Jeff. It was funny, like, we were the, always the, totally for fun. Uh, when I toured a lot in Europe, our tour manager was Swiss, so he spoke Swiss, Deutsch, German, French, Italian, English. And um, our drummer was a hysterical guy. Would just bust on him if you mispronounced a word in English, <laughs> just because you're driving around in a van forever. You know what I mean? Forever. So it was fun until one day he's like, 
you Americans, you speak one language. I speak five languages. <laughs> and we're like, I know, man. We're just having fun with you. And, you know, it's because the country's so huge. Like, the States is so huge. And, I, you know, I tried to explain that to him, too. Like, well, you border, you know, like if I drove from New York to New Jersey, that's like a different, like you're speaking a different language. It's not the same thing. So, um, anyway, blah, blah, blah. I digress. Um, all right, cool, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, really appreciate it. Hope you got had some fun. Um, is this the gold top from the Carter video from a few years ago? I, I can't, I can't remember. He was going through them at that point in time. Um, maybe. I have to go watch that video again. I think he was playing this one. And I was playing a different one, or I was playing this one. He was playing a different one. That was funny. They're like, hey, you want to do a video? I'm like, what? He's like, let's go to Carter and do a video. I'm like, uh, uh, okay. He's like, oh, let's play a blues. I'm like, all right. And he's like, uh, let's play E. And I'm like, okay, cool. And so we start playing games. Oh, let's be flat. Come on. And I'm like, gah, you know. Not that I can, that can't not play a blues and B flat, but it was my early days of being recorded in videos with Robin Ford, so I was a little nervous on that. I think one of the comments I got from one of those workshops we did was saying, oh, it was so nice of Robin to have one of his students up to play with him. <laughs> people are cool. I, people are cruel. Okay, guys, thanks so much. Please pick up the Arpeggio course, Arpeggio's Unlocked, free ebook and accompanying videos. Um, it's a way of saying thanks so much. And while you're there, poke around. I got some other courses. It's a great way to help support me and the channel. And I appreciate it. All right, everyone. BB, thanks so much. Thanks to everybody who's been here. Uh, totally appreciate it. I got to go uh, walk some dogs. You guys are the best. Thanks. <laughs>